Hello, welcome back to Piers Rocks. Last time, I introduced you to Airfrog, the tiny wireless coprocessor for ARM microcontrollers. Today, I'm going to do a deep dive into it. If you've not watched the last video about Airfrog and some of the crazy things that it can do to running ARM microcontrollers, then I suggest you do that now. Link's down in the description. It allows you to go in and access and manipulate RAM, flash and peripherals from a running Cortex microcontroller. In this video, I'm going to explain how it's actually done, where the heart of the capability is implemented by a tiny ESP32 wireless module on the Airfrog. And the protocol that I'm using is ARM's Serial Wire Debug. To kick off the explanation of Serial Wire Debug, I'm showing you a block diagram. This is from the STM32 microcontroller, but this is going to be very similar for any other ARM Cortex microcontroller. And you can see here the Cortex M4 core itself. That accesses the main bus for accessing peripherals like flash and RAM and GPIOs and USB and so on. That's all done via this bus matrix. There's a couple of other interesting boxes for our purposes on here. There's the SYJ DP and there's also the AHB AP. So DP stands for debug port and AP stands for access port. And this is at the core of serial wire debug and also JTAG, which is a slightly more complex debug protocol and requires more wires. So this is actually how you connect in to the debug capability and how Airfrog is connecting to the MCU. There are a couple of lines that come into this debug port. On some microcontrollers, they are just standard GPIOs that are configured for this purpose. On other microcontrollers, they are dedicated lines. So the RP2040, for example, the dedicated lines, although I think you can reconfigure them to use them as GPIOs if you don't want to use them for SY, SWD purposes. The debug port itself doesn't have a huge amount of capability. And really what's interesting is using that to then access this access port, which is the thing that gives you access to all of the peripherals on the microcontroller, so RAM, flash, GPIOs, and so on. But all of your communication via SWD is done via this debug port, which then talks on to the access port, which then talks on to everything that's running in the microcontroller itself. I think there may also be a direct connection between the debug port and the core for accessing some very low level core information. For example, I've used SWD to read how many instructions that the core has executed at any particular point in time, how many of those have taken more than one cycle. So really low level debug information about the core. But this gives you a huge amount of access and control over any Cortex, ARM Cortex microcontroller. Now, this isn't guaranteed to be supported in your microcontroller because, like everything ARM does, it provides reference designs to the microcontroller manufacturers and then the manufacturers decide what they want to implement. And serial wide debug, or the debug port itself, is an option. It's been in every ARM microcontroller that I've played with. Now to introduce you to the serial wide debug protocol itself. There are two types of devices in serial wide debug. There's the host, that's Airfrog in this case, that's in control of the communication. And there's a target, the microcontroller that you're actually trying to control or debug or access. And the protocol, like it sounds, is serial, so data is being transmitted a bit at a time, one after the other, rather than in parallel. And there are two lines, there's a clock line and a data line. The host, Airfrog, is always in control of the clock line. And the data line can be controlled by the host, can be controlled by the target. Now, what we're looking at here is a particular sort of operation. Really, there's only two. There's write operations. This is a write operation. And there's uh, read operations. And we'll take a quick look at a read operation in a second. And there are three key phases to the communication. There's a command or operation byte, which is sent by the host to the target. This is saying this communication is going to do this particular thing. Then there's an acknowledgement phase where the target responds and says either OK or wait, which means I'm not ready to deal with that right now, but try me again and I might be able to deal with it. 
or fault, which generally means the host has done something wrong. It's tried to access a resource that doesn't exist or it's doing something else that's in contravention of the protocol. And then there's the actual data transmission phase. This is a write, so this is data being sent from the host to the target. There's also, as I said, a read operation where data comes back in the other direction. You may also notice these funny TRN elements that are one clock cycle long. These are that's short for turnaround. And this is to allow control of the data line to move from the host to the target and back again. Obviously, the command, the operation here is being sent by the host, but then the acknowledgement is being sent by the target. And the turnaround time is to allow the host to relinquish its control of the data line and the target to take that over. We see another one after the acknowledgement, because in this case, the host needs control back again so that it can actually transmit right the data to the target. Now, most of the interesting stuff here is actually in the operational command byte, these eight bits. And there's some boilerplate, which is really just about ensuring synchronization between the target and the host. So the other four really interesting bits, there's the AP and DNP bit. And this is saying out of the debug port and access port that live on the target on the MCU device, which of those is this operation targeting? Is it the core debug capability or is it the access port? Typically, it's the access port if you want to actually access peripherals on the device. There's, is this a read or a write operation? Pretty straightforward. And then there's two address bits here. And this is indicating, this is the register on the target debug port or access port that this operation is actually going to control. All communication is done by the host with the target's debug port and access port, not with the peripherals directly. The debug port and the access port will then go off and retrieve any information that's required or write any information to the physical peripherals. But there's this level of abstraction or firewalling between access to the physical peripherals provided by the debug port and access port. So all of the communication that's being done by Airfrog here, when it's reading RAM or writing it or raising flash or controlling a GPIO, it's actually reading and writing to these debug port and access port registers using serial Y debug. And then a debug port and the access port is actually then going off and doing what Airfrog told it to. This is the equivalent read operation. You can see there's one key difference here, and that's that there's no turnaround between the acknowledgement and the target transmitting data. That's because it doesn't need to be because it's already in control of the data line because it had to be to send an acknowledgement. Instead, there's a turnaround after the data and the parity bit has been transmitted. And this is done because the next thing that's going to happen in serial wire debug, and this could be instantly or it could be 10 minutes, an hour, three days later, the host is going to want to send another command, another operation to the target. And therefore, it needs to be in control of the data line. I'm not going to get into the details of what the debug port and access port registers actually look like and the details of those, save to show you this table that shows you most of the debug port registers. And some of these are write registers, some of them are read registers, and they share the same address space. So they can be the same register that's read and written to, like the control and status register, or you can actually have different registers showing the same address, like abort is a write register and dpidr is a read register. But as I said, every bit of information is being retrieved by the host, by Airfrog, and everything it's changing on the device is going via one or more of these registers. The debug port, the access port are acting as a middleman for all of the communication. Time to look at some code. So. Airfrog is written from the ground up in Rust. Rust's my go-to pro um, programming language now for all embedded development. And what we're looking at is the serial Y debug write operation. So that entire sequence that we saw with an operation byte, the turnaround, then the acknowledgement, and another turnaround, then writing out 32 bits plus parity, that's all handled by this function. The first thing we do is we check that the data line is set to an output so we can transmit. We then actually write the 8-bit command and also do the turnaround clock cycle. That's to prepare for the target sending us an acknowledgement back. We then read those three acknowledgement bits back. In the OK case, we then do another turnaround, 
transmit the 32 bits of information from the host to the target and also write the final parity bit out at the end. This code also handles errors and retries in the wait case. Now you may notice there's a bit of extra complexity here. There's some additional clock cycles being transmitted in certain cases. I won't go into this in detail, but there are certain circumstances where you have to provide a few extra clocks after sending a particular operation to the target to give it time to actually process it. That was obviously a very low level implementation within the guts of AirFrog, the detailed implementation of the serial wide debug protocol. That's not an interface that uh, an application using AirFrog or even AirFrog's higher layers would be using directly. This is a very basic AirFrog example showing you how easy it is to actually access information both from RAM and Flash on a ARM microcontroller using AirFrog using these Rust libraries. First of all, within our application, we do a bit of boilerplate to set up the environment that I'm using here. So AirFrog is based on the embassy async programming environment for Rust. And again, this is how I do most of my embedded development today is using Rust and using embassy. So you set up a debug interface. That's really the first serial wide debug call that you're making is to tell AirFrog to set up actual physical interface using GPIOs here, GPIO zero and one. These are going to be the lines that are used to connect to the target. The next thing that's done is making this call to reset the target. So that resets the debug port on the target and it reads information from it. Now this is not resetting the microcontroller, it's having no impact on the microcontroller whatsoever. It's just accessing the debug port itself and essentially waking the debug port up and saying, hey, I want to talk to you, please. I want to start accessing some debug information. And it reads the information back just to make sure that it does identify a proper debug port. Now that's sitting in a loop here just to make sure that if it's not connected, then it will retry and eventually drop out of this loop once a connection has been established. So this allows your example to be running on AirFrog with no target plugged in and you plug it into your target and it immediately senses the target is there. Now the next thing this example is doing is just checking a bit of information about the serial wide debug protocol that's actually running on the target. That's done here and also trying to identify the microcontroller that this target actually is. Then it moves straight on and it starts reading information from RAM and from Flash. And this is the key primitive that's being used to do that, read mem. And this will read information from anywhere that's valid within the target MCU's address space. So that could be a RAM address, it could be a Flash address, it could be a peripheral address, like finding out the state of a GPIO, or reading the state of some other peripheral, like USB or Ethernet or whatever. There's an equivalent primitive, obviously write memory, to go in and change RAM address or a peripheral state. And there are arrays flash and write flash primitives as well. There's also much higher performance primitives. So this is just reading one word at a time, one 32-bit value at a time. There's a similar primitive for writing one 32-bit value at a time, but there's also primitives for doing that in bulk. And that's what I made use of in the demonstration last time where I went in and completely reprogrammed the RAM from underneath the running microcontroller and also erased and reprogrammed Flash, again, from underneath the running microcontroller. So just really a few lines of Rust to give you very high levels of control over a running ARM Cortex microcontroller. You don't need to be a Rust programmer to take advantage of AirFrog's capabilities. AirFrog exposes both a RESTful API and a binary API over the network so that you can access and control the target using any language you want from anywhere. So when I showed an example of ProBarS reflashing a target using AirFrog, that was using the binary API. Much of the web interface that you saw me using last time to reprogram the, the flash and to reprogram the RAM of the device, the JavaScript of that web interface is actually using these APIs under the covers. So via this REST API, you have the ability to query information about the target itself. You can go in and you can change the serial wire debug configuration of AirFrog. So for example, you can change its communication speed. You can change the network settings of AirFrog, its Wi-Fi settings, and so on. And you can actually go and perform both individual and bulk memory operations. 
flash operations. And if you're really hardcore, then you can actually go in and you control the DP and AP registers directly using this interface. So hardware-wise, the ESP32 is the heart of Airfrog. And I'm using this tiny ESP32 C3 Mini 1 module. So it's got the ESP32, it's got the flash, it's got the oscillator, it's obviously got the Wi-Fi capability, but it's only breaking out a smaller number of the ESP32 pins here. You can see how many in the schematic in front of you. And I'm really using only four of those pins. I'm using the serial wire debug data line, clock line, and then a couple of pins for UART for actually programming this device, and then the programming lines on the other side of the chip. That's all I need for, for this application. I've also got a 5 volt to 3.3 volt voltage regulator, so you power Airfrog with 5 volts, and it can power the ESP with 3.3 volts. And I've got two programming headers. One is to connect to the target, here labeled SDRR, and also the header to actually program Airfrog itself. That's it. And here's a close up of the Airfrog board itself. You see up here, half the size of the board is taken up by the ESP32 module, and the rest of it are the programming headers and the various passives that are required for this application. So then if we take a look at it with the actual components installed, you end up with something that from memory is about an inch long and about five eighths of an inch wide. I hope you found this deep dive into Airfrog interesting and useful. If you want to build your own Airfrog or play around with the firmware, then links that you need are down in the description. Everything that you've seen is open source. If there's anything in particular you'd like to hear more about, please drop a comment down in the comment section. Until next time, rock on.